Yanis Varoufakis is a world-renowned economist and a former member of the Greek parliament. He was Minister of Finance for seven months and resigned shortly after the people of Greece voted overwhelmingly against the continuation of austerity policies imposed by the Troika. He is also Professor of Economic Theory at the University of Athens and the author of numerous books, the latest being And the Weeks Suffer What They Must, Europe's Crisis and America's Economic Future. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. So I want to start off uh, with some historical context. In your book, The Global Minotaur, you state, there's no such thing as a Greek crisis, but rather that Greece is a symptom of a broader shift in global, in global economic history. Do you think that policymakers and everyday people should reevaluate the understanding of the crisis? And can you also take us through history and uh, help us understand this? Imagine we were in 1930, in South Dakota, or in Delaware, and we were discussing the Delaware crisis, or the South Dakota crisis. It would be absurd. Of course, South Dakotans were suffering. Of course, the weakest part of the United States of America were in dire straits. But the crisis was a crisis of global capitalism, and in particular of American capitalism. And if it weren't for the New Deal that uh, Franklin Roosevelt introduced throughout the United States, and if it wasn't even worse, I should say, uh, for the Second World War, which lifted aggregate demand and ended the crisis that had uh, been unleashed by the financial sector collapse in 1929, then that crisis would have, would have continued. Similarly, Greece is the weakest link in the European chain, therefore, it's the first domino to have fallen, and it has fallen very badly for the Greek people. But to think of it as a Greek crisis is to misunderstand, misconstrue what's been going on. Uh, the, the, we, there is one crisis, the crisis of the Eurozone, and it takes many different forms. So for instance, here in Germany, where we are now speaking, it takes the form of negative interest rates. So if you're a pensioner, your pension fund is uh, in trouble because they cannot invest your money and get interest in order to add to your uh, capital uh, for a rainy day or for when you retire. In uh, places like uh, Ireland, you have a dual economy. You have the, the Irish who manage to be connected to Facebook and Google, and they're doing reasonably well, and the others who are not, and they're doing very badly. You have a situation where France has a debt that is unsustainable as, as we speak, and, and a budget deficit which cannot be contained without creating greater social tensions and possibly giving rise to a Marie Le Pen presidency. All these are parts of the, of the same crisis. And until and unless we look at it as one crisis uh, try, uh, uh, with, with a view to identifying the causes of this crisis and the remedies for this crisis as a whole, we are going to be continuing along the path of denial uh, the price of which is uh, Europe being the sick man and woman of the global economy. So uh, you state that uh, it was the fall of the bread and wood system uh, that occurred and that America turned into a deficit nation, sucking up all the capital surpluses of the world and it played as a recycle, if you want to put it that way, uh, of people's labor uh, profits. And it was the collapse of this system, this recycle mechanism that Wall Street played that led to uh, the European crisis today. Is that an accurate depiction? Let me restate, yes, but let, let me restate it using my own words. Mm -hmm. um, capitalism requires surplus recycling, just like the planet requires environmental recycling. So does capitalism require a mechanism that takes the surpluses, the profits, if you want, from where they're being produced and invests them in areas that are in deficit, that have losses, where demand is low, unemployment is high. Unless you have this recycling mechanism, capitalism fa failure, fails. These recycling mechanisms are part and parcel of every major state or have been for 200 years now. Germany had it, Britain has it, so think of Yorkshire as a deficit area and London as a surplus area. Unless you have the British state recycling those surpluses from London to Yorkshire, uh, the English Union breaks down. Uh, and that applies to the global level as well. The Americans understood this perfectly well as we were exiting the Second World War, and this is why they set up Bretton Woods. 
And Bretton Woods had two pillars. One was stability of foreign exchanges, exchange rates, uh, managing the value of money throughout the, the global capitalist economy. That was one pillar. And the second pillar was recycling. For the first 10, 15 years of Bretton Woods, the Americans were recycling their own surpluses. They were the only surplus country, effectively. Europe was uh, in ashes after the Second World War. And the Americans, think of the Marshall Plan. It was not a philanthropic exercise. There was an element of philanthropy, an element of geopolitics, pushing the Soviets away from the, the heart of Europe. But from an economic point of view, from a macroeconomic point of view, the purpose of the Marshall Plan is to take dollars surplus from America, give it to the Europeans, so the Europeans could buy American exports. <laughs> um, and this lasted as long as America had a surplus. But towards the mid to, end, to the end of the 1960s, America lost its surpluses. And there was a great worry in Washington DC at the time. How can we remain dominant if we have no surpluses to recycle? And the answer that they gave, people like Paul Volcker, uh, was brilliantly simple and audacious. And he was, okay, if we can't recycle our own surpluses because we don't have any, we'll recycle other people's surpluses. So from the 70s onwards, with the collapse, the, 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 the willful destruction by the Americans who had created Bretton Woods, of Bretton Woods, uh, what we have was a second post-war phase where America operates like a huge vacuum cleaner. It sucks it in, into its territory the exports of Germany, of Holland, of uh, you know, the oil exporting countries, of oil in other words, mm -hmm. uh, of Japan, later China. And how was it paying for this deficit? By sucking into Wall Street the profits of those companies, of the foreigners. So it was recycling other people's money, other people's surpluses. And this was doing, it was doing this magnificently uh, and audaciously up until 2008 until the financialization bubbles that were built on this capital flow to Wall Street exploded. And since then, this recycling mechanism worldwide has breaking, broken down and we have a global crisis. Europe, because we tried to create a mini Bretton Woods here with effectively the Euro, but without recycling mechanisms within Europe, we are the sick man or woman of the global economy because we don't have this recycling mechanism within our territory. So it's not uh, social security, um, programs, it's not uh, inflexible labor markets, it's, this is the root of the crisis, if I understand you correctly. Let's, let me give you a very simple example, because if you can't explain this simply, you, can't, you don't understand it. It's very simple. Compare Nevada and Ireland, two states uh, that are very different in terms of aesthetics. One is green, the other is d desert, but in terms of population, more or less the same. Mm -hmm. The economy is based on um, low corporate tax rates, on financial companies, on uh, real estate, very similar to Ireland. Now, compare and contrast what happened in 2008 in Nevada with what happened in Ireland. And do it by imagining that the dollar zone, the United States of America, uh, were structured like the Eurozone was. What would have happened to Nevada? I'll tell you what would have happened if America was structured the way Europe is. Catastrophically, in other words. Okay, what would have happened is this. The first thing that, that went wrong in both Nevada and Ireland, was the real estate went down, prices collapsed, developers lost their money, they couldn't pay the banks, the banks went bust. Yeah? The difference was that in, in, in the United States, it was the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC that salvaged the banks of Nevada. If the, the state of Nevada had to borrow internationally in order to bail out the banks and pay for the unemployment benefits of the construction workers like the Irish had, then the state of Nevada and the banks of Nevada and the economy of Nevada would have gone down the drain. And then there would be a domino effect throughout the United States. This is exactly what happened in Europe. We have a common currency, but we don't have these shock absorbing recycling mechanisms that the United States has developed over a period of 150, 180 years. I keep an open mind on privatization. If, when people ask me, are you in favor or against? My answer is it depends. 
which privatization and under what con conditions and circumstances. I mean, when Margaret Thatcher introduced privatization on a neoliberal agenda that I fought against, I used to live in Britain then, I used to demonstrate against uh, the, uh, Mrs. Thatcher's policies, but I don't believe that Mrs. Thatcher would e ever consider selling all airports to one company because the point of privatization was to bring competition into the market. That's, there's no competition there when one company buys all the airports.